Split rule bill. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. De Mr. Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to establish independent local planning processes to determine housing development planning applications submitted by local authorities and for connected purposes. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill is designed to improve scrutiny and transparency in the planning process, particularly in light of the growing appetite by local authorities to build more homes for private sale themselves and act like a, a pri private developer than a local authority. Honourable members will know that at present the foundation of our planning system rests with an impartial assessment of, of a planning application being carried out by the local planning authority. This assessment takes into account the Council's own planning policies and the views of a wide range of consultees. In, con in conjunction with bodies like the Environment Agency, Natural England and the relevant Transport Authority, a local planning officer will then either determine the application under delegated powers or provide an officer recommendation and allow councillors on the relevant planning committee to make the final decision with regard to key planning issues at hand. The fundamental point in the current process is that both the assessment and determination of a planning application is independent. Uh, in the majority of cases, the current system works well, and local planning authorities can deal with the full spectrum of applications it receives from individuals, SMEs, large private developers, housing associations, and other parts of the public sector. Yet in a system that works well, there are examples where local authorities can effectively mark their own homework. Many local authorities will bring forward applications for new council housing, or in the case of unitary authorities, new schools. And this means that the councils would, in effect, be both the developer and the applicant. Generally, generally speaking, these applications relate to core council and public services, and so perhaps these relatively infrequent conflicts of interest could be overlooked. However, and as I alluded to earlier, Mr Deputy Speaker, many local authorities are beginning to move away from provision of just council housing and core public services, and instead are focusing on building more houses for private sale. In effect, councils are starting to act more like a private developer. And nowhere is this more evident than in my own constituency in Eastleigh. As I've raised in the House previously, the Lib Liberal Democrat Council in my own local authority are taking forward a large-scale application of 2,500 houses in the village of Horton Heath, all built on green fields and to the considerable dismay of local residents. Here, the council has borrowed large sums of money to fund the development. The Council has bought land off of, 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 off of a private developer and expanded the original planning permission for the site from 900 homes to 2,500. And we already know that the profits from this development, which are overwhelmingly for private sale, are built into the Council's future budget. A borough council, which I hasten to add, currently has a debt of £540 million, or £4,000 for every man, woman and child that lives in my constituency. Not a good business model, I would argue. But this questionable business model is contributing to Eastleigh having built 49% more housing than required by government targets in the last three years, and is continuing to inspire them to build 4,311 houses in the next five years, nearly 20% more than targets are asking for. Naturally, this has left many of my constituents feeling angry and let down by the planning system. These plans appear to go through the Council's own planning system with ease, when this level of overdevelopment is the policy of the Liberal Democrat administration. Many residents are rightly asking how this can be right when there is such an obvious conflict of interest. And we must ask ourselves, where is the independent scrutiny that we apply to other planning applications? Is there any realistic proposition that this application would be refused when the Council is so heavily invested in a project, both financially and politically? Or to a lesser degree, would the Council treat itself in the same way as a private developer when it comes to issues like transport, flood mitigation, density or the provision of affordable housing? My experience, I say to the Minister, is not. It should also be acknowledged that even if the current system doesn't generate any difference in the treatment of applicants, the perception of applicants being treated differently is just as damaging to the whole system. To be clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not saying that local authorities should not be able to build and develop housing themselves. I ent entirely agree that they should. However, what I'm concerned about is the lack of transparency and the absence of the usual checks and balances afforded to other developers. It stands to reason that if a local authority wants to act as a developer, it should be treated as such and shouldn't take advantage of the fact that it is the local planning authority. And that is why I believe that this bill is absolutely vital to protect the integrity and probity of our current planning system. In simple terms, the bill would reform the process by which planning applications made by a local authority in its own area would be determined.
The process will ensure that any application made has been scrutinised and determined properly. Before outlining how these reforms would operate, I will first set out the process for triggering the new independent process. This mechanism for determining applications could be triggered in one of two ways. The first way to trigger this new process would be if a local authority brings forward any development of 300 units or more within its own administrative boundary. This would automatically trigger the independent process. To supplement this and to provide a mechanism for the public to trigger this process, the second way would require a level of public engagement subject to a threshold. When a local authority submits a planning application to itself, there would be a grace period of 30 days before a planning application is processed. Process. Local authorities would be obliged to set up an online portal that allows people to register their request for the independent process to be triggered. If 10% of the, of the electors of a council ward affected by the development sign the petition, the independent process is also triggered. This, is not only, this not only provides a safeguard for multiple applications just below 300 units, it also allows members of the public to direct controversial applications to the independent process if a suitable number of electors is reached. This then leads to the reforms to the actual process. Once the independent process is triggered, the first step in the independent process is for the planning application to be assigned to a statistical neighbour planning authority. The neighbouring planning authority would allocate a planning officer to act as the case officer, and the case officer would determine the application in line with the host local authority's planning policy and usual consultees. A fee would be paid to the neighbouring planning authority from the host planning authority to cover the costs in officer time. The decision then, will, then would be referred to councillors at the host planning authority for determination. The public can be assured, however, that the officer recommendation is based on an independent assessment of the planning merits. The second part of this independent process would also automatically refer any decision made by councillors from the host authority to the independent planning inspectorate. In order for the planning application to be approved, it wouldn't be necessary for, an for a planning inspector to ratify the decision made by councillors. If the planning inspector disagrees, the application would then be referred to the Secretary of State for final decision. Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe this small but significant reform to our planning system would bring much needed transparency back to the current system. It would ensure that local authorities submitting their own planning applications are subject to pro proper scrutiny and would also provide reassurance for members of the public and constituencies across the United Kingdom. It would end the conflict of interest that exists in the current system and ensure that local authorities are not granting pla planning permission to themselves. Mr Deputy Speaker, the planning system, and I say this as a former planning committee chairman, can be a game changer for house building across the UK. However, many people still see it as opaque and favourable to big developers. This is a small step to correct that view uh, and give our residents the reassurance that they need. I commend this bill to the House. I have been given no indication that anybody intends to oppose this motion, and indeed I see none, so I intend to pose the question. And that question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as of that have been say aye. The contrary, no, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Christopher Clarkson, Sarah Brickcliffe, Robbie Moore, Ben Everett, Scott Benton, Andrew Griffith and myself, uh, Stephen Hammond and myself, Mr Deputy Speaker. Paul Holmes. Second reading, what day? Tomorrow, Mr Deputy Speaker. Tomorrow. Thank you very much. Those leaving the chamber, please do so carefully and COVID conscious, please. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Now. Order. Order. Before 